Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Uh, we're going to have fun this morning. Now, to really enjoy yourself this morning, hopefully you listened to last week's, because last week's is part one. And you know, I, I'm, I'm convinced that things are like geometry. If you don't learn the basic theorems, it's difficult to add step two and step three and step four. So... The key is, uh, we're going to continue, this is part two of understanding how to dismantle a house of thoughts. A house of thoughts. Dismantling. And I gave you the story of the Amish people that came to my property when I had a large two-story building, was about to build a sanctuary, but there was a a thousand-seat barn that used to be used for summer camps. They had revivals there. David Wilkerson, many famous speakers in that day were there. Uh, But in order to make it part of the parking lot, we had to dismantle it. And I was looking at the expense of dismantling this huge barn. And then I contacted the Amish, and they did it for nothing, for the purpose of salvaging all the lumber, the wire, the seats. They had theater seats that sat a thousand. You know the old time theater seats where yeah. they popped, kind of popped up, you had to push them back down to sit. And they said, we'll tear it down free of charge. We just keep everything we find. And they have wonderful lumber, Lord knows, plus cement block. They came and they chipped cement blocks out one at a time took them wherever they went, probably a couple, a couple garages worth. You could have probably built two garages out of some of those cement blocks. And then the fire department came and said, you've got just a little bit of wood rubble left. How about, how about if we come and practice by burning it up? Go oh, help yourself. So it cost us nothing to clear the land. But what the Lord is speaking to us is to dismantle a house of thoughts. You have to clear the land before you build and plant. Jeremiah said it real good. Even the anointed word of God coming through a prophet in Jeremiah 1 says, to root out, pull down. Root out has to do with planting. You root out the weeds. Root out, pull down strongholds, right? Then it said, destroy, which actually had to do with planting. It meant destroy the land of all the weed growth, which is preparation for planting and uh, throw down. To throw down meant I'm going to build something beautiful on top. i got to flatten everything because we're going to build something beautiful on top of it. And actually, that description is really the way, a consistent way, the way God works. You can't build and plant anything until the heart is proper. And you can't really win the battle without until you win the battle within. So there's a dismantling that needs to take place. And the dismantling is done according to a pattern based on principles. It doesn't change. The patterns and principles don't change. And one of the things that we want to cover today is, and I'm going to pray with people so you can actually see it, um, to deal with bitter roots. Bitter roots come in. Strongholds come in. Mental strongholds, things that you say, that's just the way I am, which is nonsense. If it isn't God, it's not the way you are. It's the way you made yourself or the way you responded to other people's accusations, circumstances, what have you. But nonetheless, it's a house of lies. And a house of lies has a life of its own. It begins to operate in your life, and you just say, oh, that's just the way I am. No, that's something that needs, if it's contrary to the Word of God and it's contrary to what God says you are, then you're basically needing to dismantle that house of thoughts and bring it to nothing. Now, um, we mentioned in prayer today, it just really rose up, that God's way is he gives revelation, the sword. He gives a revelation to divide asunder, say, this is flesh, this is spirit, you choose now, right? And we want to walk by the spirit, not according to the flesh. The second thing uh, that he says is, uh, uh, I'm going to separate, this is flesh, this is spirit, but I'm separating it 
for the purpose of clarifying so I can put you back together again. And lastly, that unification is so that you cooperate. And um, Satan's way is a counterfeit to God's way. That's God's way. God gives revelation for illumination. He separates for clarification, so you pick and choose that which is spirit, that which is life. And lastly, he puts back together again for the purpose of cooperation. He wants, uh, just like it says in the message translation, the, the God tools. We have these powerful God tools that are able to take every loose thought, emotion, and impulse, that's mind, will, and emotions, and put it together in a life shaped by Jesus. That's ultimately what God wants. Satan's way is a counterfeit. He wants you to take any revelation and then get in your head and interpret it according to your fancy, according to your likes. <laughs> and people do that. They'll take a revelation. I'll never forget when Bishop Hammond was teaching on the prophetic one. One guy said, I'm a guy, and the Lord's going to give you a new wife. Good, I didn't want the last one. I'm going to get me a new one. That wasn't necessarily what he meant, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you have a tendency, demonically speaking, and the ways of the world, you have a tendency to interpret even a legitimate revelation coming from God. You have a tendency to interpret it through selfishness first. got to make sure that self is dead and that it's coming through a genuine work of the cross. Because revelation, Satan's way is revelation for you to interpret it, not godly interpretation. Interpretation that you like, your preference. Separation, and here's the other one, and the church is known for this. Whether you believe it or not, you can get your feelings hurt, but you can get healed, all right? You can get this up. But separation for isolation. If you're isolated from the body, it's either due to a, a wounding that God can heal, or you're being demonically inspired to isolate because even a heathen society I mean the worst societies on the face of the earth are still social. Do you ever think of that? They still have community. If you're violating from that, it's a tactic of the enemy to isolate you. He wants to isolate you for the purpose of separating you out from the kind of relationship that would bring your life fulfillment. So there's really no justification for a recluse. You can't do it. And uh, you can't just say me and God, and it's not people. I'm, I'm telling you, there's, there's a, a, a term that Watchman uh, Witnessly actually uses a lot in his translation of the Bible. I don't know if it's because of going from Chinese to English or what. I don't see it in the other translations. But every time he's talking about God, he's talking about for your enjoyment. Jesus is there for your enjoyment. He uses that word enjoyment. I don't know what would we have in our scripture, delight. But he makes it sound like when you, you feed and drink on the living, the living word, that it's for your enjoyment. He uses that word enjoyment a lot. And the thing that I saw missing, even in the church, I got it though, so it's not totally missing because I still get excited once I saw it. Paul says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded and being of one accord. There's nothing that thrills me like that. And I see it on Tuesdays. It's a one accord. And um, it's a coming together for the purpose of unification for cooperation, because there will ultimately be an assignment for people that can come together. Where two or three are gathered in my midst, I'm in the midst. So apparently it's favorable for God for two or three to come together. And um, everybody should have somebody that you can be accountable to, somebody that you can open your heart to. And as that relationship increases, there can be a multitude of people uh, that can uh, you can not afraid to be vulnerable, but anyway, uh, in session one, the number one truth, the number one truth, is location, location, location. If you don't know where your parts are, how do you respond biblically? You know, you've got to know that your mind is here. Your thoughts. Most people got that one right. <laughs> Your will is here. This is the door of the heart. This is, where the, this is where your spirit opens or closes to people. And by the way, when you put up that wall with some people, that is not Jesus. That is not a boundary. 
That is your flesh saying, I'm going to take care of this myself. Because the proper boundary is to always put Jesus and the peace of God between the two of you. The only legitimate wall is peace. Peace will guard your heart and your mind. Peace will protect you. Peace will crush Satan beneath your feet. You have nothing to fear. So in message number one, the primary thing is if you do not know how to bring negative emotions to Jesus through a work of the cross and see them transformed and rendered powerless, that's the cross, when those negative emotions are rendered powerless and the fruit of the Spirit takes its place, you are then in a position of authority to renounce house of thoughts. If you don't deal with the emotions, Jennifer's giving me the bobblehead up here because that was the part that she saw what was missing when we traveled church to church. People were trying to renounce lies, renounce lies, say all the right answers, but never deal with the power of the negative fear, hurt, lust, anger, guilt, shame. You don't deal with that stuff behind your words. You have no power. You don't have enough anointing to blow fuzz off a peanut. All right? Is that, is that Southern? I don't know. I'm trying. All right. Hey, I'm a city boy. South Chicago, livestock was pigeons and squirrels. So you got to cut me some slack. And a, gar and a little tiny garden was the farm. <laughs> All right. Anybody that grew anything in their backyard, it was it's a farm. Wow. Now, in part one, the key was understanding the emotions. And I strongly suggest it's on YouTube. It's probably had about, uh, I don't know, I haven't looked lately, but it's over four, four or 500 views. And that is absolutely essential to get that part right first. Because we're going to go to the second part. We're going to assume you know all of these things. You know how to locate. You know how to surrender. You know how to yield, right? And uh, i, I got to call some up. Stephanie, come on up a minute. I want... Stephanie's my prize pu pupil. She has a reserve seat up front. There. She comes in late. It's okay. <laughs> Whoa. Would, wouldn't you like that privilege, huh? But she came every Thursday and would pray in front of everybody, pray through stuff, knowing that, yes, I need the ministry, but these people could benefit from me saying the hardcore, difficult stuff out loud. And I'm telling you what, that you can't get higher on my list of favorability than that. Most people wouldn't mind getting ministry, but they don't want nobody to know. All right? She's willing to let people know unless she's changed her mind. <laughs> Let's pray through a healing the way it should be done. And, okay, I want the first person or situation, just say it out loud. Uh, an old co-worker. A co-worker. She's picturing the co-worker here. Now she, she could actually minister to anybody in this room easily. What's it feel like where your hands are? The seat of the emotion. Yuck. Yuck. Then we're going to let Jesus the forgiver behind your hands, out of my belly. Expanded Bible says, John 7, 7, 37, 38, out of my gut flows rivers of living water. I let, let. I notice she isn't saying the right answer. She's doing it. You do it before you say it. Most of the church says it and then Maybe they do it, maybe they don't. I let forgiveness go until it changes. Nod your head when it changes. Okay. All right. Now, if we were going to, if there was a lie, and there's only a lie out of every 30 or 40 healings like this, there's a lie, but if there was a lie, she would know how to deal with it. If there was a lie, we would say, okay. But that co-worker thing reminds you of where, where did that, that wounding get started? You can, you have something? Oh, no, I don't, but I'm okay. agreeing with you. Okay, she's agreeing with me. All right, so suppose she says, well, actually, that co-worker reminds me of when my mother took away my favorite outfit and said I couldn't wear it. 
trying to be girlish here. It's not easy. <laughs> All right. So what we would do down here is I, I receive forgiveness for having judged my mother. I release forgiveness to my mother. And if that's where that started, about all co-workers are like my mother, I now, if she's got peace here and forgave, what's peace mean? Let the peace of God rule. Who's ruling? Jesus, the Spirit. If the peace of God is ruling, then she could renounce with power. I renounce the lie that everyone's like my mother. All bosses, all co-workers are like my mother. I renounce that lie. And then what would we say? What's the truth? And the first thing that would come up, like the first thing that comes up is, no, it's my response that's the same. They're not like my mother. Or God loves them as much as anybody else. Or whatever comes up is going to replace the lie. That dismantles the house of thoughts. Does that help? Okay. We can't do that for demonstration because 30 or 40 emotional healings don't necessarily have a mental stronghold. But I wanted you to see the process of how you would do it if you had it. Okay, thank you. Anybody have a lie that they recognize? that they hear repetitively. It has a life of its own. It's a house of thoughts. This is a hardcore course because most of them have been through this 60-day challenge 12 times. They're living it as a lifestyle. You know how to deal with this. But for the benefit of people, the hundreds of people that are watching by YouTube, they don't know how to do this. Trust me, we travel church to church. We saw in the best churches. They... Here's, here's where I saw the dilemma in churches. Uh, the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, thou shalt be saved. Do you believe that? Yeah. But do you pay attention to the very next verse? It says, for with the heart, with the heart you believe and with the mouth confession is made. I think we need, we've emphasized the first one at the expense of the second one. You need to believe in your heart before you confess with your mouth. If you went to a Billy Graham crusade and you went forward and asked Jesus to come into your heart, it was the heart that started the process. Then with your mouth you confessed. We're doing it backwards. We're confessing with our mouth the right answer, but nothing happened in the heart except that we are sincerely cerebral, <laughs> which still means you're sincerely wrong. Okay? So I want to see more and more people letting God build. And except the Lord builds the house, they that labor, labor in vain. But trust me, uh, the, the house needs to man dismantled. You've got to deal with the emotion behind the thought or you will never change thinking. You will never get your mind mindset renewed, by the way. By the way, the renewing your mind is not just thinking. Renewing your mind set. That's the way the Hebrews understood mind, will, and emotions. Jack Hayford's very clear noose in the Bible. N-O-U-S is, is mind, will, and emotions, all three. Am I right, Jennifer? By golly, Jennifer's getting something out of this message because she's, she's nodding her head left and right here, so... All right, so, you know your Bible heart, for God desires truth in the what? In the inward parts. Well, where's the inward parts if you think your heart's here? Or you think you, you got to do everything up here? God desires truth in the inward parts, and it's in the inward parts he will make me to know wisdom. What, what you know in your knower comes up and moves forward. John 7, uh, still, the expanded Bible says it the clearest. John 7, 37 and 38, and it even talks about the fact that there was a water ceremony uh, being poured out in the background when Jesus lifted up his voice and said, If anyone thirsty, let him come to me and drink, for out of his belly, gut, bowels, heart will flow rivers of living water. Does that give you a location a little bit clearer? So God expected that river to flow. Did you ever look in Ezekiel? 
What's, where's the river flow from? The base of the temple. And wherever that river flows, it's a picture of Jesus and what he was going to give after he gave the Holy Spirit. It's also in the living water. Now, if you know where your Bible heart is here, you know how to yield the will here. Is there anybody that doesn't know how to yield the will? Raise your hand, even in this room. Yield your will. How about, uh, how about Jeremy, your visitor? Can I have you come up here? We'll see if this visitor knows anything. All right. All right, very good. They know, gee, I go to church with Jonathan, and the next thing you know, they call me up. Oh, brother. I wasn't expecting <laughs> Okay. Close your eyes. Uh, point to your will. Where's your will? Close. This is the heart. This is the blood pumper. There's only one verse of scripture that this is the Bible heart. And that's that men's hearts will fail for fear. In other words, there's a computer up here, and what they're calling the second brain. There's a computer down here. This is the gut, the second brain. There's neurons here, and there's neurons there. There's a little computer chip right there. So computer, computer. This is the enteric nervous system. When you get a feeling, and do you ever wonder why you get a lump in the throat? Because the enteric nervous system is the gut and the esophagus. You'll feel something down here. It'll rise up. You get a lump in your throat, get embarrassed. Maybe your face gets flushed. That's all emotional, but it's not coming from here. It's coming from here. And it's not coming from here. The neurons are here and here. That's why they call this the second brain. So here's where the will is. You're going you're to learn something. Put your hand right there. Close your eyes. Oh, it's unnatural to fall backwards. I want you to fall backwards into my hand just a little bit. You feel that change here? That's your will. And you, you won't need any more demonstration from now on. Once you learn location, 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 you're going to read the word different. You're going to live your Christian life different. So if you were to hear the song by uh, what they used to sing at the revival thing, uh, I Surrender All. How would you surrender all? Close your eyes and show me. So you want to do what that song says, I surrender all. How do you yield? You're doing it. You're doing it. You're doing it. Now, what I'm saying is doing it, I'm operating on being able to feel his human spirit yield. Was I right? I said there, you're doing it. You're doing it right when you were doing it. If I can feel the tip of the iceberg, how much more important is it for you to know what's going on in you? All right, so that's to get you back to understanding the emotional realm. Okay, um, there's your will. That's the seat of the emotions. Okay, close your eyes. I want you to just uh, say out loud the first person or situation that you see in your mind. Don't try. Just easy. First person. Yeah. John. Okay. Down here. What's the feeling? Just picture him there. Good or bad? Good. Good? Okay. Uh, there's hesitation, though. No? Okay. I'm just not good with crowds. Huh? I'm just not good with crowds. Okay. All right. That's good. Just release loving intercession to them right now. That means out of your... There you are. You're doing it. Releasing loving intercession. So when you love in the Spirit, and now you add words to that, guess what? There's anointing attached to your words. Just say, bless them. Bless you, John. Yay! <laughs> There's anointing behind that. You, you can't say, but here's what we saw in the church. We saw people quoting Scripture like this. Oh, perfect love cast out fear. Oh, perfect love cast out fear. There's not enough anointing on there to change anything except, you know what it is doing? Fortifying the fear in your life. You're strengthening it like a muscle. You have to deal with the fear before the word has any authority over it. You have to go from the heart to the mouth, not the mouth 
and hopefully the heart will change. Very good. Thank you. You can sit. Yeah, appreciate it. And he's over to go, Jonathan, why did you tell me to come here? Oh, no, no. <laughs> That's his buddy, though. That's a good yeah, thing. Exactly. He's got relationship. Yeah, good. Relationship is good. All right. So you locate your thoughts. You locate the seat of the emotions. Um, and for, for, the, for the men who like to say they don't have emotions, that that's a woman thing, the first time I mentioned that, Jennifer said, oh, yeah, I've seen them on the road. They can't tell me they don't have any emotions. What they mean is they don't have any good ones. <laughs> But, and I know because I got that sermon in my kitchen, huh? Here's the way Jennifer ministers to me. This is the way the, the preacher's wife ministers to the preacher. She, she didn't like it because I thought everybody in the world should have gone to Dennis Clark's school of driving. And they didn't. A four-way stop, they don't know who has the right-of-way. They're making left-hand turns from the right lane. I go, uh, they, they go below the speed limit in the passing lane and stay there. So Jennifer says, honey, I think you need a sermon. <laughs> honey, then you know it's coming. Honey, it's preceded by honey, look out. Honey, the road is a microcosm of the kingdom. Uh-oh. I was in trouble already when I heard road. The road is a microcosm of the kingdom, and that's God's road. And those are God's people, and he places them wherever he wants. But he lets you see what's in your heart while you're on the road. Is that a good one? Take it. That's free. That's free. Now. Here's the, here's the correlation that Jennifer discovered when we saw a lot of people getting helped in a very short period of time. But they, they have to acknowledge this. Now, secular science is already acknowledging it, and they're teaching it in biology in school. Emocognition, emovolition. I was a baby Christian, and God was taking me to the school of the Spirit, and the first thing he taught me was every thought has a corresponding emotion. Every thought in your head has an emotion behind it. Even if you just call it yuck, even if you don't know what it is, you know the difference between good, and, you know what it is. And every thought has a corresponding emotion. But the most beautiful part was while I'm praying, I, I saw my foreman's face and I felt this. Ugh. And I knew to release forgiveness to that foreman. I didn't change the picture. I saw him snarling at me, release forgiveness, and then felt nothing but peace in the gut while I saw his snarling face in there. So I forgave him. I didn't erase him. I didn't put Jesus in the picture hugging him. All that garbage. And instead, I saw that I could remember him without the yuck, remember him without the pain, remember him without the hurt, remember him without the anger, remember him without the fear. Then you're making progress. That's making progress. That's sanctification. That means it went through the work of the cross. Now, the words of a gossip are like wounds. They go down into the innermost parts of the belly, Proverbs 18.8. So if somebody gossips or says something bad about you and you take it in, where does it go? Where does it go? It doesn't just go to your head. You go, hmm, they said something nasty about Jennifer. You go down here into the belly, into the gut, and it doesn't go away unless you deal with it. Emotions don't die. They get buried alive. I remember one time we were traveling, and uh, uh, person paid to have us go to this church. Uh, but what I didn't realize is 
they paid the uh, and told the pastor that they would cover the honorarium if Dennis and Jennifer came. Uh, we didn't know that at the time, but the pastor didn't like us. But he didn't want to lose the person who was paying the bill. And when we got there, he just couldn't resist it, though. He, he made fun of uh, Jennifer's southern accent. I responded, I saw this guy really must have been forced to have us here because he don't want us. I released forgiveness and probably gave one of the best messages that church could have gotten. But I released it instantly and had no problem preaching a, a message with love on it. But I got in the car and Jennifer said she forgot, forgave too, but I could still feel it in the car, right? And so what she did was then saying, I must have let it in somehow. So she received forgiveness for letting his, whatever you would call that, disparaging remark, come in. And she got the peace and it lifted in the room. And then she was free to pray for him and release blessing to him. You see, it, it sets you free. It isn't even about that other person. And the people at the, that had paid the honorarium so we could go to that uh, church saw what was going on, left that church, and made tremendous progress from that time on elsewhere. Um, there's, there's so much that God taught me that by dealing with that negative emotion, he says very lovingly, Dennis, don't let anything come between what you and I have together. I don't know how other people would interpret that, but for me, when he said don't let anything come between what you and I have together, he's talking about bad feelings. Some people live with bad feelings, and hey, that's the way I am, you know. What, you're a bad feeling? <laughs> if you don't deal with it, it doesn't go away. Emotions don't die, they get buried alive. And now secularly, they're teaching, as of the early 90s, uh, they're teaching emocognition, emovolition. The church has not caught up to that concept yet. The church still says uh, thinking controls everything. No, the power behind the thought. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. It doesn't just mean the words, it means what's behind the words. Well, where are those words coming from? Are they coming from the world, the flesh, the devil, or God? It depends where they're coming from. It depends what supernatural emotion is empowering those words. So, um, the lamp of the Lord is, uh, the lamp of the Lord looks deep inside people and searches through their thoughts. Proverbs 20, 27, the expanded Bible. So the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord searching all the innermost rooms of the belly. What is that but going to the emotional seat and welcoming God to search? If there's anything in me, search me, O God. And what, what does Psalm 139 say? Search me, O God, for anxious thoughts. What kind of thoughts? Oh, the, so in other words, it's not just the thoughts that are negative. It's the anxiousness behind the thought that has to be dealt with, or you will never renounce that thought and live with the truth. The truth can't be built and planted until there is a dismantling of the house of thoughts and emotions that have formed the structure and taken on a life their own. Okay, I'm going to jump ahead now finally. Yielding. Everybody's, by this point, I'm going to skip that. It says, when we say drop down, it's actually to sink into in order to be clothed. Sink into. Our Bible says put on. Put on is really drop down. Put on, you sink into in order to be clothed. You sink into it. Peace will guard your heart and your mind. But you go to peace within. He himself is your peace. He'll guard your heart and your mind. So I'm going to skip the yielding. You've got to get that down uh, and understanding peace the supernatural peace of God, but I'm going to kind of jump, jump ahead. 
what you're looking for to take place down here. You use a word that's your own subjective experience. Assurance, awareness, a transaction, uh, the title deed, <coughs> some kind of an exchange between the yuck went to peace. That's an exchange. That's an assurance. That's substance. I love it when people use the word faith wrong. They just go, oh, I'm just going to I'm just gonna love my wife by faith. I don't think she wants whatever's coming from you at that moment. That's not faith. You add the word faith to anything that's not real in your life does not make it so. Amen. And that's very common to just add faith. Well, I'm just doing it by faith. By faith, I'm doing this yard work with a great amount of uh, resistance, anxiety, <laughs> but by faith. All right. What God's looking for is substance. It's something. Faith is not nothing. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's tangible. If you don't have that tangible inner knowing, you don't have it. You're not doing something by faith unless you have the inner assurance. It's the faith of God. Now, now we're going to get to the good part. This was all easy stuff. But for hundreds of people watching, this is like learning a new language. Do you realize that? You can be church 30, 40 years, we know, because we went church to church. And it was like, they go, it's like learning a new language. But perhaps that is probably something that is going to be essential in the days ahead for you to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. This isn't about Joe Heavy Speaker knowing how to do this. It's about equipping people to know how to deal it in themselves and then help other people. Now, here's the difference. We said Jeremiah 1, root out, pull down, destroy, throw down. All of that is to make ready to prepare and print. And quite frankly, the scripture was saying, Jeremiah, I'm putting these words in your mouth, and that's what they're going to do. The word of God will through the work of the cross, root out, pull down, destroy, throw down, and you can build and plant now. But here's the, the, the key, bitter root. A bitter root, Hebrews 12, says a bitter root, beware lest a bitter root spring up. Pursue peace with everyone. And if you're not pursuing peace with everyone, you will be cultivating a bitter root. A bitter root builds a house. That house has to be dismantled. A bitter root springs up, causes you trouble, and defiles others. You know, everybody's responsible for their own sin, but you don't want to be the one who's pushing them to sin. That's what a bitter root does. A bitter root is a push. We had to teach uh, our, our, our daughter, Allison, uh, how to deal with that, because the, the best example of teaching somebody to do it was uh, we work in the house. Two computers are in the office, but then the teenager thinks you've got nothing to do. You're at home. Is that possible? She would come and stand in the door, not say a word, and you could feel the push. Come on, how many don't know what I'm talking about? You can feel when somebody's pushing even when they're not talking. Don't give me that. You don't know. Your spirit knows that, and you don't even have to be saved to know that. Your spirit has a comprehension it knows stuff she was standing there and we had a rule that because she was she was quite an aggressive young lady um, it's like, Allison if you ask your mother something with that push that I can feel coming from you while you're standing in the doorway saying nothing, the answer is automatically no now, her temperament is win-lose. That would be a loss, right? She was more like, I think, in terms of win. She let go instantly, and I could feel that relationship. Just like when I had uh, <clears throat> people up here yielding the will. She yielded the will. So you have, you have the ability to know where it's at. Even then, she didn't have any training, but she knew where the will was. And I said, that push. You're pushing. And she'd go, and the funny thing is, she saw there's a benefit to yielding, even in the natural. As soon as she yielded, I said, honey, what do you want? I need a ride to the mall. I'll take you. 
But if somebody pushes and the answer is automatically no, it might be a lesson in life that that's not the best way to go about life. You might be a mover and a shaker, but I'm probably getting calls from all the bloody people that along, the, along your path of freedom. <laughs> all the collateral damage. What? As a young pastor, that was my favorite of appointments, the husband and the wife that would come in together. Come here. How's it going? The, the, the guy go, good, good, really good. The woman go. <laughs> and that was pretty much across the board. So, what, we, what we have here is a failure to communicate. <laughs> we have different standards, apparently, <laughs> for what is good. Now, here's some laws of relationship. And in this amount of time, if you're a note taker, this would be this would be so beneficial for your private prayer time. First of all, and I saw this work. I saw this work first place. The law number one is the law of sowing and reaping. And be not deceived, God's not mocked. What a man sows, he shall reap. It's a universal principle. You cannot violate sowing and reaping just because you don't like it. It's a it's there. I saw Jennifer work in a BEH class. You know what a BEH class is? Behavior disorder. The teacher couldn't handle the students. Jennifer was a school psychologist, so all the kids that this teacher couldn't handle, they put them in one room. <laughs> I still question that. Let's, let's put all the behavior problematic people in one room. What? That's a little too much like church for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> and, Except in church, they fake it, all right? But <laughs> this was real life. These were kids that were 15, 15 years old saying, by the time I'm or 13, by the time I'm 15, I'll be dead or in jail just like my friends. and da, 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 Like Kevin, remember? Mm -hmm. And God told Jennifer to go to the Bible store and find her. She had some liberty with a Christian principal, secular school. Get them what their names mean. Well, Kevin was a gang leader, or a wannabe gang leader. I want to be, and she put up his thing on his little cubicle. And Kevin means um, one of kindness, and he went. <sighs> and Jennifer goes, "You mean in your whole life you were never kind, even one." Time? All of a sudden, Mr. Kindness emerges. Oh, there was this guy who didn't know how to fix a flat tire. Well, there, 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 was, there was a time that all of a sudden, this guy who had no kindness whatsoever is remembering all of his acts of kindness. He uncrumpled his paper, put it back up. <laughs> but Jennifer said, she held up a pen. And the law of sowing and reaping, this primary rule, and you can't get around She dropped the pen. She said, there's a law called gravity. You don't have to believe in it. Doesn't matter whether you believe in it or not, it's going to work anyway. Well, there's a law of sowing and reaping that works, and you don't have to believe in it, but it works anyway. And boys, the things you judged your fathers for, you will do the same thing. Boys, the things you judged your fathers for, you will do the same thing someday when you get married. You'll be just like him. Right on. Huh? Girls, the things you judge your mother for, you will do the same thing. Girls, the things you judge your fathers for, you will reap someday through a husband. You don't have to like it. You don't even have to believe me. But sowing and reaping works. And you say, if you don't believe it, God is not mine. What you sow, you will reap. It doesn't change. Little Kevin, along with almost everyone in the class, well, how many were in that class? 30 maybe? Thirty people that the teachers couldn't handle. Wow. Jennifer gave them the law of sowing and reaping and didn't have to even get the other four laws. It works whether you like it or not. But they were all unless you forgive. These are 
doubt if there was a Christian in the bunch. But one by one, they can't do it in public because see the dynamic. If you're playing off of each other, you're all Mrs. Clark, I need a private appointment. I got some people I need to forgive. Because he went he went ballistic when he says, if you don't forgive your father, you will be just like him. Well, he hated his father. And now you're telling them there's a law that says you're going to be just like him. And in that unforgiveness, that is exactly what will happen. You could try to fake it and find a cover-up, like strict parents. You could hate your strict parent. You could become super lenient. You didn't get healed. You just did the opposite. You're still bitter on the inside. There's still a house of thoughts there that says you are trapped in this house of thoughts. But I'm telling you what, God's bringing to the church a freedom of dismantling those house of thoughts, those bitter roots, and in the, in the process of pulling these things down, he's going to start building and planting something that's beautiful, something precious. Uh, but these house of thoughts take on a life of their own. Because what you sow, you will do it. Even if you know better, you will do it. The beautiful thing is, is like right now, I'm seeing that what we have, even as a small local church, that one accord that I see on Tuesdays uh, fulfills my joy. Did you ever notice the Apostle Paul says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded? There is a joy in seeing God work in a larger context than just what he's doing in your life. Most people don't think about joy at that level. The joy... Fulfill my joy by having fellowship one with another. Seeing that kind of unity produces something of value. And the two ingredients, even, this is Jennifer's area, and if I mess it up, don't correct me. I just pretend like I know what I'm talking about. Oxytocin and dopamine. They're two chemicals. And what's interesting is oxytocin allows you to bond like a mother holding her baby. It's got to hold her for more than 20-some uh, seconds or something for it to really produce anything. But there's an exchange and an, and, a, and an internal increase in oxytocin, which is the ability to bond. You take that further, and it's with husband and wife, you take that further, it's with friends. You take that further, and it's the church, the bonds of peace. It comes from an oxytocin that is capable of relationship. And it goes to the pleasure center in the brain that brings pleasure and uh, a sense of satisfaction. Dopamine is the devil's counterfeit. Dopamine <coughs> is like... So you sneak off and, and uh, take drugs. Then you feel guilty and ashamed. So you repent of the guilt and the shame, but there's no comfort. You end up going back and doing more drugs because that's how you get comfort. Dopamine is never satisfied. There's a, the dopamine center in the brain will never, never satisfy. Oxytocin satisfies, but it goes into the pleasure center of the brain and gets satisfied through oxytocin and quality relationship that you can have with Jesus and with people. Dopamine never satisfies, but you're still addicted to get comfort. Well, I blew it. Now I feel guilty and ashamed. So how do I comfort myself? I'm going to go blow it again. That's a sad way to live. That's the sowing and reaping that destroys lives. And you can't just say, that's the way I am. You're going to have to say, I, there's a house of thoughts that need dismantled. The second principle of relationship is the principle of increase. Whatever you sow, you reap. I was raised in a city where... Uh, they, uh, even the gangs had what they called a war counselor. They decided whether it was going to be fists or worse. And we were raised with the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. We thought that was proper. 
I punch you, you punch me back, we're even. Does that make sense in a kind of a logical way? I punch you, you punch me back, we're even. And it's like what God's saying with sowing and reaping is the law of increase. You reap a harvest. You punch, don't ever resolve that attitude in your heart, and you're going to get punched periodically the rest of your life. How does that sound? Huh? It's not a one-time deal. It's a harvest. It's the law of sowing and reaping, and you can't escape it. There's a law called increase. What you sow, you will reap, but you reap a harvest. You sow to the wind, you reap the whirlwind. <laughs> you plow iniquity, you sow wickedness, you're going to reap the same. <laughs> so the, the law of sowing and reaping, there's a law of increase. And then the judging is what got young Kevin. The judging has two aspects to it. And that's when you who judge, you'll do the same thing. And you who judge, that same measure is going to be measured back to you. Ugh. You could say, that's not fair. <laughs> it's a law. You don't have to agree with it. You don't have to believe in it. You don't have to do anything about it. But that law is operating in your life, whether you like it or not. The last one, and this is where we saw a lot of wonderful transformation in people's lives. Because bitter roots start at an early age. And... The law of honoring and dishonoring parents. We honor our parents by forgiving them and getting our hearts right with God. You don't condone their bad behavior. You don't justify it. We saw a lot of people didn't get healed of some of the judgments they made their parents because they made excuses for them, calling that love. No, that's an excuse. There's no healing for excuses. <clears throat> you forgive them. You don't say, well, you know, it was during the Depression. That was the best they could do. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I lived in a bad environment. I was a bad kid, uh, but that was the best I could do, was being a bad kid, because it was all my friends. That was their fault anyway. They were a bad influence on me. You can go that route. It doesn't work. But honoring your mother and father that the life might go well with you. And honoring your mother and father does not mean honoring their bad behavior. And people can't say, but you don't know what I've been through. I purposely tell the gruesome stuff that happened in my own life only because I'm tired of hearing you don't understand. I don't have to understand you, but Jesus understands. And if you won't forgive somebody, do you have a problem with Jesus forgiving them? Because then you're really, you really got issues. You're one mean character. If you've got a problem with Jesus forgiving them, if you've got a problem with that, you're mean. And it's in there. It's a house that needs dismantled. <laughs> and God say, honor your mother and father means to forgive them. And I still remember um, my grandpa hated my dad because he was illegitimate. Like it was my dad's fault. <laughs> you know, he didn't really have anything to do with it, did he? No. But my grandfather hated him because he was illegitimate, and it was a reflection of him and his sin. He ignored my dad his whole life. My dad went to night school, graduated, and everything. He says, Dad, I did this. I did Always oh, trying to, what are you trying to do when you're like that? Trying to get their attention, trying to get acknowledgement. None of that worked. I was born, my dad did the same thing to me. He didn't do it on purpose. It's the law of sowing and reaping. It was generational, and it... It happens. If you don't get healed, guess what? You, you who judge, you do the same thing. He judged his father, and it was legitimately his father was evil in, in, toward his mother, toward, toward him. But so what? That doesn't do you any good. You become like that. Well, when God taught me this, and I was always invisible to my dad. As a matter of fact, even the, the, the hardest time that God had me pray through was when my sister had spinal meningitis. He acknowledged my sisters. He just didn't acknowledge me. We're in the hospital, and he said it out loud. Why her? Why could it have been him? So I knew right then I took the clue. He didn't really like me. <laughs> and I released forgiveness to him. I learned from it. And the day came when I was a young pastor to where he came forward with tears in his eyes and let his son pray for him for the healing of rejection that he experienced in his life. 
That's a good what goes around comes around. But had I not done it, there would have been no redemption for him because I'd be stuck in my little self-righteous, you don't know what you, I've been through. You don't know what my father said on my sister's illness. You don't know. You don't. That is an excuse that God can't heal. It's like, get a life and get real. God's real. And you know what's really even crazier? As mean as a snake that you might be on the inside and you're failing to admit it, at the same time, God loves you so much he wants a relationship with you. You don't even want a relationship with yourself. <laughs> and God wants a relationship with you. I say, go. it's a good deal. Go for it. Right? But the way to deal with a repetitive thought. So I want to give you this as homework in closing. Because like we prayed with Stephanie, if Stephanie would have had one. But emotional healings, for the most part, don't have a lie attached. For the most part, it's just get the emotion out of the way and get on with life. But there are ones that are bitter roots, strongholds. And then that's the case. Here's the way you would do it. If the thought is repetitive, intrusive, in other words, it speaks loudly, it causes you to lose your peace, it's attached to a root. That's point one. Ask the Lord to show you when did that thought get started? I hope someone's taking notes on this, because if you did this, you would get yourself set free, you and God. Ask the Lord where it got started, the entry point. You close your eyes and you say, well, actually it started probably in the time that second grade school teacher embarrassed me in front of the whole class or whatever. Then release forgiveness there, renounce the lie that I am... Uh, I am uh, inferior, there's something wrong with me, whatever the lie was, renounce that lie. First, feel, forgive, make sure you get your peace. Then, after you feel peace, then, after you dealt with the emotion, otherwise you're just giving lip service, after you get peace on it, through the forgiveness of God, toward God, self, or others, once you get peace on it, then I renounce that lie that I'm no good. What's behind that? I renounce that lie. Peace? What's peace mean? Jesus is ruling. Let the peace of God rule. You have authority in your words now. By the authority of the name of Jesus, I am renouncing that lie that I'm no good. Now, this is the part Jennifer used to love to sit in on one-on-one -on -one appointments. She loved this part more than anything when we would hit it. What's the truth? <laughs> The truth is, I'm his little love. I'm his little love child, and he wants a relationship with me. I'm special. I'm a one of a kind. I'm. There never was another me. There never will be another me. And he loves me in my uniqueness. That will get written on the tablet of the heart. One. I'm talking five minutes of being honest with yourself. That'll be written on the tablet of the heart. That's what that means. Have it written on. And twenty years from now that will still have the same strength that it had then, if not stronger. You will start living out of that house of thoughts, having dismantled the lies and the false structures that had a life of their own. Now, Jesus is going to have a life of his own, living through your thought life, and you will act accordingly. You will respond accordingly to all of life. Deal with the entry point when that came in. Get your peace. Renounce the thought and then ask Jesus for the truth. And I'll tell you what, it's the most exciting time in private appointments is watching when that truth comes and seeing the smile that comes on their face. But they're not just saying clever Bible verses. They're saying the reality of Jesus is speaking up on the inside of me. The living word is saying that. And by golly, I own it. And I can't and no one else can take it away from me. And you'll have proof. It'll be easier to believe than to not believe it. That's when you own it. That's when the house of thoughts was built by God. And except the, the Lord builds the house, you labor in vain. And I, I get so tired of methods and systems of people trying to get better. When in reality, at best, a lot of it's just behavior modification. Behavior modifications, you start doing a new thing, but the heart's not right yet. 
If there's garbage in the heart and you change your behavior, who cares? That's what those people like say. I had the joy. I had the joy of the Lord by faith. <laughs> Keep it. I don't want it. I want the. God gave me emotions to experience the fruit of the Spirit, and I want the reality of it. I don't want your faith version. That's not really. Actually, it's your fake version. <laughs> So, Father, we just seal this work right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. We, we believe with all of our hearts that there's going to be the joy that I'm going to see more and more people as we did overseas and others and in um, South Africa. People are practicing the, the peace challenge. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, we're getting emails that changed lives are taking place everywhere for whosoever will actually apply themselves. The only ones this doesn't work for are the ones that think, uh... I like me the way I am. Well, that's good. You and Mr. Rogers will get along good. But Jesus wants you changed. Father, we just seal this work right now by the power of the Holy Spirit and believe that it's going to multiply greatly in the days ahead. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, that's forgive123.com.